about our presenter, Carlton Young, right here, has undergraduate degrees in economics and English from Westminster College and Twin Park University, an MA in history from Ohio University, and his PhD in the history of education from the University of Pittsburgh. For 37 years, he has taught a very popular advanced placement history class at Thomas Jefferson High School in Pittsburgh. He has also taught classes as, as an adjunct professor at the Community College of Allegheny County at the University of Pittsburgh, Eastern Gateway Community <coughs> College, and in the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at, at Carnegie Mellon University. Let's give a nice big hand. <laughs> starts with something that probably many of you in this room had to experience at one point in your life, which was about uh, 12 years ago, we had to clear out my parents' home. They passed away, they uh, lived over on the other side of town in uh, Churchill. And it was a house I'd grown up in. I wasn't expecting to find much of anything I wasn't familiar with in that house. And if you have ever experienced that, you know it's not just um, furniture and appliances and things. It's all that stuff, you know, closets and drawers and storage areas and going through the inside. What are you going to keep and what are you going to get rid of? Well, up in the attic, we found this very old wooden box I'd never seen before. I had no idea where it was. And we opened it up and started going through it. It turned out to be a very large collection of letters written by two brothers fighting in the Civil War. These uh, two brothers, their last name was Martin. It was um, Henry and Francis Martin. They were from a little town up in Vermont, <coughs> a town called uh, Williamstown. And I had no idea that uh, these existed or, or what these letters were doing there. So um, now, you know, I had and then a lot of letters to deal with. And when I say I have a lot of letters, um, you know, I've seen entire books based on someone having, you know, like, 20 letters of a Civil War soldier, 40 letters, or 60 letters. Why well, about 250? So it's in this huge collection. They, um, this is the, um, the box that they were in. And, uh, the letters all in their original envelopes addressed to their parents back home. And so you know, I have a bit of a background in history, but I've never really uh, specialized in any way in the Civil War. So. The next step was, I tried to figure out what to do with these letters, was to call in a couple of friends who were much more Civil War buffs than um, I'd ever been. And so we have um, one familiar face, probably for some of you up there, is uh, Ed Hale, who's um, spoken here before, and also Bill Lutz, who were um, history teachers at uh, Keystone Oaks. And so um, they took a look at these letters and said, yeah, these are really good letters and uh, yeah, very in-depth and involved. So we do have to do something with them. So the next step was, okay, we need to call in our wives. And so my wife, Carol, is here tonight, uh, Ed's wife, Nancy, joined us. We had a, a team of five then that started to go through these letters. And reading through the letters ended up being a very difficult process. We began to have weekly meetings to go through them. The first step was just get them all organized, get them in the acid-free folders to protect them, get them um, set up in terms of who wrote each one, from where to whom in, um, in order, and then trying to actually transcribe and read through the letters. And this ended up being, we said, a um, very slow, difficult process. A um, e example of um, one of the letters is up there on the screen. And the way this works, if you think of a piece of paper that's folded via letters, you have page one in the front, 
and two through the middle, and four in the back. So if you turn it this way, you have one to the right and four to the left, which is what is up there on the screen. And what we have in this letter is uh, this one was uh, written by uh, Henry, who entered the service for first, right into his brother back home. So it's written from camp in front of Richmond, Virginia. This is early in the Civil War in uh, June of 1862, when uh, during the Peninsula Campaign, the Union Army almost made it into Richmond. Writes it to his brother, gets to the end, signs his name, and then thinks of something else he wants to add. Well, they had paper shortages. He did not want to waste another piece of paper. So he turns the letter sideways and writes directly across what he's already written and then signs his name a second time. Right here. This was called cross writing. And it was relatively common among the Civil War soldiers. And among our two brothers, they did this a lot. And so we had done a lot of these cases where we were going through these letters. This one very similar, where um, once again, he gets to the end of the last page, goes and turns it sideways, writes across it. Or in this one, another thing that you sometimes do is start writing much smaller as you get to the end. That would be oh. creating challenges. It still wasn't enough, so they went back to page one and threw in cross writing up here. Or another thing that would happen, it would seem that when it would start a letter, oftentimes he'd be writing very slowly and carefully, and it'd be relatively easy to figure it out. But then as the letter would progress, it would become increasingly sloppy and writing faster and much more difficult, and then throwing in some small writing down there. Or just one other example. This one uh, has a little bit of everything. Not only does it get very small and very sloppy, but then he goes back to page one and throws in the cross writing here. So the five of us would sit there at our weekly meetings, and we'd uh, oftentimes get stuck on a word, and we'd turn the letter this way and that way, trying to figure out which way it was going. And sometimes we'd sit there you know, for two or three minutes in silence or mumbling to ourselves what that word was. And then usually someone would get it, and you know, they'd shout out the word, and we'd say, yeah, that's it. And then we'd want the next word, and on like that, all the way through it. So it was a very, uh, very long, uh, very slow process trying to get through them all. It took us uh, several years. And then when we finally did, the next step was to go back to square one and start all over, because we'd skipped so many passages and words we couldn't figure out. So now we do the handwriting better, so we went back and started going through them all again. And by the time we got through the second time, we finally had all the letters transcribed. Well, the other thing we did was to start to travel. We would travel to um, the battlefields, take copies of our letters, and show them to the park rangers and park historians, and uh, be able to go to the spots in the battlefield where our soldiers had fought, and uh, just sort of like follow in their footsteps. We also traveled up to Vermont several times, and got to go to the hometown of our um, two soldiers. So uh, Williamstown, Vermont, is this little town in uh, central Vermont. It is, um, uh, this is sort of the town center right there. That church, you see, is the um, church that our two soldiers attended, which is still there today, the Congregational Church in Williamstown. And just to jump ahead of the story a little bit, uh, when we were up there this last fall, you know, one of the things that amazed us in our letters was how fast the mail service worked back then. From this little rural community in Central Vermont, at the um, battlefield camps, sometimes the soldiers would be responding to letters that had just been sent like a few days earlier, and the people would send care packages, food and per you know, perishable goods. They would send in packages that the soldiers would eat. So um, one of the things that their church oftentimes sent was chicken pies. Well, we were up there last fall, we're driving past the church, and there's a big sign out front, chicken pie dinner tonight. <laughs> Apparently, uh, a lot of the churches do this. It's kind of like the uh, fish fries around here, is they uh, have these, these chicken pie dinners. And so we were able to go to our soldiers' church and eat the, um, maybe the same recipe that they were using back in those days. But anyway, the first time we got up there, we arrived in town, parked over by the church. Next to the church is a Civil War monument Okay, right here, so we thought, isn't that great? You know, we came up to find out about our Civil War soldiers. Here's a monument right in the middle of town. So we go up and we start reading the monument, reading the names of the soldiers in the town. Our two soldiers were not on there. We're thinking, this is crazy. We drove all the way to Vermont, and our soldiers aren't listed. 
So we know, you know, we have their military records and the letters, we know that we did. So um, this was one of many mysteries that made this so interesting for us. Uh, for, for me, it was a mystery of, you know, I knew my family history a bit, I'd never heard of any Martins in my family. I didn't know why these letters were in my parents' attic. I didn't uh, know why my father never said to me, oh, by the way, you like history. You should see what I have in the attic. I got this huge collection of letters. The, the numbers made a whole lot of sense. And this one, we did pretty much just figure it out. That by going through old town records, we found that when they built this monument in 1869, the uh, town had decided to only put on the names of the soldiers who were drafted to fill the town quota. Our two brothers enlisted, so they were not eligible. We're thinking there must have been some kind of local political dispute, something going on. You know, why would you leave off the enlisted soldiers and not under them? But um, anyway, that explained why their names were missing. So next to the uh, monument, <coughs> next building down is the Historical Society. We thought, okay, let's go in there. We walked in and uh, told them the person inside a little bit about the letters. And um, we said the letters were addressed to their, the soldier's father. His name was Chester Martin. So we said, you know, we, we know this was a century and a half ago, but have you ever heard of a local farmer named Chester Martin living somewhere around here? And the person in the store beside said, well, well, sure, Chester Martin, his, his house is right down the road, give me directions. So we went down and uh, sure enough, we found the house, that uh, house still standing, this is it. And not only is the house still there, but it is today the front of like an assisted living nursing home complex. They've taken out the back wall, built the nursery home to the back and to the side, but the original house is still there, and the original house is now like the um, entrance and um, lobby area for the nursing home. And so, not only that, but the um, people in charge have decorated the whole inside to look like 19th century. So, we had no idea we were going to walk into this. We go into our soldier's town, we find their house, we walk in the front door, and it's like it was at the time of the Civil War. The, this was the living room where the parents sat and uh, went through these same letters that we've been going through. So it's just been one amazing thing after another. Um, after that, we went up to the, um, we found the cemetery they were buried in. Went up to the cemetery, we were walking around, um, reading all the names. We saw this sort of like fenced in area towards the back, and thought, you know, is it possible? And went back, and sure enough, that was our Martin family in this um, one, uh, big plot area with our, the two soldiers and other family members buried there. So, uh, to look now just a little bit at the soldiers themselves and their story, I'm going to do, uh, start off with uh, Henry. He's the younger brother, and he's the one who enters the service first. Uh, from what we know of Henry, he seems to have been a um, relatively friendly, uh, well-liked person, even though he's not smiling in the picture, but people didn't smile in photographs or portraits or anything back in those days. But when the, um, when he was, uh, his regiment was first formed, this regiment was, um, it was part of what was called the Vermont Brigade. The Vermont Brigade was the um, second through the sixth Vermont Infantry Regiments. And both Henry and his brother were both a part of that brigade. It was a, a brigade that was renowned for their um, courage and their um, success in battles. And so um, he's part of this very uh, elite group. But um, he's also someone who uh, was chosen by others in the regiment to be one of their officers. And these were people, you know, a lot of them had been in school together, from the same county, they know each other. And so they must have liked and respected Henry uh, to some degree. They were, uh, make him a sergeant to start off. Well, the, um, the other thing about Henry is uh, he's got a pretty good education. That back in those days, the, um, for most children that went to school, education would have ended at about um, eighth grade. But for families that had a bit more money, their children could go on to um, private secondary schools. And that's what Henry had done. He had attended Barry Academy in uh, nearby Barry, Vermont. Williamstown is about six miles south of Barrie, and Barrie, in turn, is about six miles south of the uh, state capital of Montpelier. My uh, father had grown up in Barrie, Vermont, so we always knew these letters had to be connected to my father's side of the family somehow, since uh, Williamstown is so close to it. 
But at any rate, um, Henry does have this good education, having gone to this private secondary school. His brother, Francis, has also attended a uh, very good school. That, uh, he has attended uh, um, Kemble Union Academy, a uh, private residential school over in New Hampshire. And even their, uh, their sister, Caroline, and this was especially rare you know, from a small farming community in a rural area like this to um, send their daughter to a private residential secondary school. But that's what the family did. They sent uh, Caroline to um, the school, which was uh, Mrs. Peabody's Select Family School for Young Women, which was um, located on the uh, campus of Dartmouth University in um, uh, Webster Hall there on the campus. And so this is a family that very clearly valued education. And I think that's one of the reasons that their letters are so good. Because um, you know, I've read a lot of soldiers' letters from um, other accounts since, since getting involved in this. And uh, lots of times the letters are not very well written. And uh, it's very often not all that interesting. But these soldiers wrote, these two brothers wrote very well. They um, really. Uh, let people know what it was like in the camps and the battles and all the things that they're going to be experiencing. We also had in, the, in with the letters all kinds of other things. We had lots of handwritten orders that got mixed up with the letters. We had um, things like officer commission papers this for, uh, for Henry. And we also, um, by putting together my family tree to uh, connect to the soldiers, I found a, a cousin who I didn't even know I had and contacted her. And she ended up having Henry's sword. And so his full name was actually William Henry Martin. And so we have on his um, sword W.H. Uh, Martin, Company A, 4th Vermont Infantry. So to look now just a little bit at the um, letters and Henry's experience, that when the, the regiment was first formed, it was just after the first battle of Bull Run. And so Henry's going to be traveling He's never been far from home before, so it's going to be a real experience for him, very exciting, as he travels by both um, railroad and uh, steamboat to get to Washington, D.C., where the Army's being trained. And in one of his early letters, he writes back about that. He says, we left the cars, marched to a place called the Soldier's Rest. There we stacked arms, ate supper, spread our blankets, and slept the rest of the night. In the morning, we were detailed to unload the baggage cars. After dinner, we received orders to march to our encampment about three-fourths of a mile from the city of Washington. There we joined a large army of 40,000 men. I never saw such a sight before. There were thousands of cavalry, flying artillery, infantry. The cavalry were on drill when we arrived. They attracted considerable attention. Their charging at full speed because of the flying artillery was a grand sight. So this is a real exciting time at first as um, Henry's getting involved in all this. The, uh, the camp itself is um, this is the uh, Vermont Brigade Camp, that it's located on the grounds of um, where the CIA headquarters is, head, is uh, located today, just outside of um, Washington, D.C. And so I have thought maybe I should show up someday and tell them a little bit my, about my letters and say, is it okay if I just sort of like look around and check out the area here and <laughs> see what the reaction would be. But, um, but at any rate, uh, that, that is the grounds that they're on. And while they're there, Henry is um, going to be doing some things that, that would have never really occurred to me, he gets to do a good bit of sightseeing. You know, they're in this camp for many, many months outside the Capitol. And so when he has time off, he's going to go into Washington, D.C. He will cross the uh, Chain Bridge, which um, I found this photograph, the Chain Bridge, Civil War era. At the uh, other side of the bridge, he can get public transportation, get into the city, and he'll visit the Smithsonian and visit um, the Capitol building and tour all around the city. So for a while there, things are going very, very well for Henry and these other soldiers. But then come some problems. Problems involving disease. So you have the situation of all these young guys from all over the north. Uh, many of them never traveled around before. Now they're all mixed together. There's, um, so there's going to be problems with um, the uh, immunities, diseases. There's going to be uh, issues they just simply don't know a lot about good hygiene and proper health, and so people begin to get sick. Henry writes, there's a great amount of sickness in the regiment. Charles Lynn's very bad, John Green's unwell, 
Faye's on the sick, sick list, also Dick Jones, Cosgrove, Frank Flint. Measles and mumps are prevailing extensively. Newell Carlton's quite sick with typhoid fever, but we hope he'll soon be better. Well, his, um, his friend, who he'd just been in school with um, not long before this, uh, Newell Carlton does not improve. In a later letter, Henry writes, as soon as he was confined to his bunk, I had him moved to my tent, where was more still and more spare room. He remained there about two weeks, received as good a care and attention as he had given the circumstances. He was not in his right mind at nights, constantly spoke of his father, and was finally removed to the hospital. There he grew worse every time his fever changed. Last Saturday night, about 8 p.m., he died. So this became the first of many friends and relatives of Henry who will die in this war. And the situation just keeps getting worse and worse with the um, health in the camp. In another letter he says, when we left Vermont, my regiment numbered 1,100 strong, able-bodied men. Over 60 have now died of disease, and a great number more are sick. My company numbered 101. Today, only 36 privates were available for duty. So the um, situation deteriorates even further. Another letter he says, I see sights that would make anyone of you at home shudder. Almost every morning we see outside the hospital a corpse of one of our fellow soldiers, there to remain till the next day. Finally, the corpse is placed, is dressed, placed in a pine coffin, ready for burial. And this is a, a photograph of Vermont soldiers at their camp, burying one of their uh, fellow soldiers. And the, uh, in this letter goes to the whole procedures of everything they do during these burial ceremonies. And he gets to the very end, I think his last sentence is kind of interesting. He concludes this all by saying, all of these scenes we become familiar with and think but little of. So it's just like an everyday thing. When someone dies, they take them out, they bury them, they go back to their training, and on and on it goes. Well, before we look at Henry actually getting into combat, I wanted to um, mention another thing that was really very interesting for us, and one of the things that really slowed us down, was Henry would be forever talking about other soldiers or people back home, and we'd start to research them and find all kinds of interesting stories about these other people. Like, for example, one of uh, Henry's relatives, the uh, Lynn family from there in Williamstown. This is uh, Henry's uncle, Isaac Lynn. Isaac Lynn, very early in the war, will be given the command out west, um, way out west in um, uh, New Mexico. And he will, uh, early in the war, find himself in a situation where a group of Texans came across the border into New Mexico. Isaac Glenn took his men out of the fort to take on these Texans. They fought in the little known Battle of Mesilla, a very, very small battle by Civil War standards, uh, only about 30 casualties on each side. But then Isaac Glenn will pull his men back to his fort. He decided, though, the fort was not defensible. So he uh, made the decision the next day to have his men do a quick march to another fort. Unfortunately, some of the men could not bear the thought of leaving their stores of whiskey behind. So many of them filled their canteens with whiskey instead of water. The next day, out in the hot desert sun, people were getting sick and dehydrated. The Texans caught up with them, surrounded them. Isaac Lynn had to surrender his entire force. Um, he will be relieved of his command then. And so while Henry is in camp outside of Washington, D.C., his uncle Isaac is back in Washington trying to get a meeting with Abraham Lincoln to give his side of the story about what happened out there. The, um, uh, we have um, also Isaac has a son who's in the same regiment as Henry. So, uh, Henry's uncle is spending a lot of time out at the camp with them during this time. But Isaac Lynn also has a daughter. His daughter is um, Louise, who was married to Brigadier General Frederick Dent. Frederick Dent, back in his school days at West Point, had been roommates with Ulysses S. Grant. And in fact, had introduced Grant to his sister, Julia, who Grant later married. So Henry's cousin from this tiny little town in Vermont 
is not only married to a Brigadier General, but she's sister-in-law to Ulysses S. Grant. And Isaac Lynn has another daughter. His other daughter, Mary, is married to Major Norman Fitzhugh, who is Assistant Adjutant General for General Jeb Stuart, who if you're familiar with the Civil War, Jeb Stuart is on the other side. He's the uh, cavalry leader on the Confederate side. And so it just amazed us from this tiny town, all these connections and stories we would find of people who had um, significant impacts, not just on the Civil War, but some of them also later on uh, have a big impact as we move later into the century. So now back to Henry and his story. Henry will be, at first, under the uh, command of uh, General McClellan. Now if, you're, um, if you're familiar with the Civil War, you know, General McClellan will get a reputation of being extremely slow moving and cautious and seemingly trying to avoid battles. And that kind of attitude will be uh, shown in Henry's letters as well. In um, one of his letters he says, we still remain in camp. You can see how many expectations we have and how few are realized. Soldiers remark quite often that they will never have a chance of seeing a rebel while they stay in this army. And so that was kind of like the attitude, like let's get to it, Let, let's start the, having some big battles and things. And, and McClellan will eventually, even though it seemed maybe that at first like he was just kind of sitting around not doing a whole lot, he actually just put together a plan. And the plan he comes up with is going to be to um, transport this enormous army of the Potomac, it's called, the Army of the Potomac is the army in the, um, in the east, the Union Army, that uh, its main goal is to capture the Confederate capital of Richmond. And so the plan that McClellan comes up with is going to be to transport the army by sea to um, Fort Monroe and then attack Richmond from the east and that way try to avoid a lot of the defenses the Confederates have set up by moving in from this direction. So Henry will be a part of this force that moves by sea to Fort Monroe and then starts up the peninsula. It's going to be a very um, slow moving process as they will be pushing the uh, Confederate defenses ahead of them and fighting the, several small battles. One of those battles is fought right here along the Warwick River. It is the uh, Battle of Dam Number One. And unless you're a real Civil War buff, you've probably never heard of the Battle of Dam Number One. But for Henry, this is a real significant one because this is the first time he's ever really gone into combat. And so he writes, this was a memorable day in my experience, the first time I ever faced cold lead from an enemy's guns. And he will talk in his letter about how they um, get up at 4 a.m. and get uh, talks from their officers and have their breakfast and then uh, head off into this fight. That these are um, some of the um, earthworks that are still there today that the Confederates had built these are back behind them. So Henry will be part of this force will be attacking into um, these defenses. He writes in his letter about that part of the battle. He says, our colonel led the charge, flourishing his sword, encouraging his men on. Not a man flinched from his duty. It was a desperate charge, I'll assure you, in the face of thousands of rebels. My regiment lost only 10 killed. Other regiments suffered fearfully. And the enemy must have lost hundreds of shot and shells kept bursting over their rifle pits. But he gets to the very end of this letter. He says, I never expected to feel as I did on the occasion. After the first few shots, I felt perfectly self-possessed and ready to go anywhere ordered. This is a hasty outline of what occurred, and I must close. And if spared to survive another battle, I shall write as soon as possible. I can't imagine what his mother thought when she got that. He's saying that if I'm not killed in the next battle, I'll write home right after. I'll just uh, see how it goes. But um, anyway, he will be moving on now into more battles as they um, move up the peninsula, and they will be. Um, pushing the Confederates ahead, moving all the way up to um, right outside the city limits of Richmond. They'll get within 12 miles of Richmond. And at that point, General McClellan calls it to a halt. He feels the defenses ahead are too strong to break through unless he gets more reinforcements. In reality, he greatly outnumbers the Confederates, so some people think if he had really pushed ahead, he might have this early in the war captured Richmond, but instead they stop. And, um, but Henry has made it the whole way up the peninsula, and uh, actually 
a couple years ago, my wife and I decided to travel up and down the peninsula. We started down here in Fort Monroe and traveled um, to all the spots Henry was at. And so at um, dam number one, I uh, took a picture there and posted it on Facebook and said, uh, dragging my wife to another damn Civil War site. <laughs> we uh, made it all the way up and, uh, to all these places Henry was at. Well, the, uh, Henry's also seen a lot of interesting things as he was moving along in this campaign. That uh, for one thing, the uh, famous battle has uh, just taken place between Mary Mack and the Monitor, and Henry's able to get a close look. You can see here over all the shells of hit on the, uh, on the Monitor, the, uh, the ironclad that the uh, North had. And uh, Henry writes home about it. He wasn't real impressed with the ship, actually, but he writes home all about it. And uh, he's um, also seen the, the use of the um, balloons, hydrogen-filled balloons. We'll write about them, how they're being used to uh, get the, um, see the troop movements and the uh, Confederate positions as they're set up. Well, the uh, next step in all of this is we get a bit of a change in um, leadership on the Confederate side that General Joseph Johnston had been uh, seriously injured in this fighting, and he now is replaced by Robert E. Lee. Lee decides that rather than just defend Richmond, the best way to fight this Northern Army is to attack, to uh, move out of the city and attack this invading force. So what we get is a whole series of battles. It's called the Seven Days, a whole week of fighting on the peninsula, and Henry will be involved as the uh, Union Army is pushed back uh, down there past the Malvern Hill. Henry will be involved in a lot of the battles that take place there. He will be um, right up here at White Oak Swamp. At White Oak Swamp, he's part of a um, rear guard force, which is trying to uh, stop the um, approach of um, Stonewall Jackson, who's bringing Confederates from the Shenandoah Valley to try to join up with Lee. And this force does significantly slow Jackson down, so he's not able to join Lee at Malvern Hill, where Lee was um, hoping to have him. Another uh, part of this fighting that where Henry's involved is going to be at Savage's Station, that Henry uh, wrote that because a large Confederate force was approaching after the battle, they had the, the Union soldiers had to leave their wounded behind. And I found this photograph, which is the wounded Union soldiers being left behind as the rest of the army moves out, and um, they're being left with Confederates because there's no way to transport them at that time. So um, in the fighting that occurred, the end result of all this is that the Union army was forced far away from Richmond. Lincoln's going to feel McClellan has, um, has failed in his job, so he reduces McClellan's authority, orders McClellan to move the army up north of Richmond to join up under General Pope to invade Richmond from the north. So Henry's part of this force which moves to the north, but before they get up there, Robert E. Lee figures out what's happening, moves faster, gets up to um, find General Pope's army, which is located on a very familiar battleground at Bull Run, where the first battle of Bull Run had been fought. Now they fight the second battle of Bull Run, and it ends the same way, another defeat for the Union Army. Uh, Pope, uh, because he's defeated, Lincoln decides he's not the man for the job. He's probably not real sure who should be in charge, but what he's going to do is Lincoln meets here with McClellan and will um, restore McClellan's authority. So now it's going to be McClellan's job to take on Robert E. Lee. And as it turns out, Lee at this point has decided to try to invade into the north. He's going to move the Confederate Army up through Maryland and then he hopes up into Pennsylvania. And it's right at this point in the war, McClellan gets one of the uh, biggest breaks in the war. Lee has divided his army into small groups as they're moving up through Maryland. One of Lee's commanders left his maps behind at the campsite. The maps showed all the positions of all of these groups of Confederates who were moving up through Maryland. If McClellan had moved very rapidly, perhaps he could have wiped out each one of them. McClellan does not move rapidly, he moves very slow, slowly. But um, he does have some reason for that, that um, uh, he did have to be concerned that this might be a trap. Maybe these maps were left there on purpose to try to pull him in. And so he is going to move cautiously, but that will give Lee time to try to get his army back together again. So the uh, next step in all this is uh, Lee is uh, positioned up here around the Antietam Creek at Sharpsburg. 
and he's trying to get his army back together as the Union Army is approaching. Now the Union Army is going to be moving through uh, this whole mountain range here, which is called South Mountain. There are gaps to go through. Henry's part of the Sixth Corps. What they're going to be doing is trying to move up through Crampton's Gap and facing the Confederate defenders that are there, that are at least trying to slow them down as Lee gets his army back together again. So Henry fighting here at Crampton's Gap. We know from his letters he was at the end of the front row charging up the hill and found this uh, map that shows Henry's regiment, Fortune Wise, so he is at the very end and in the front. And I found the drawing of this battle, which, um, so Henry is somewhere down in here, charging uphill into these Confederate defenders, which um, must have been a very, very difficult thing to do. But as it turns out, the Union Army does greatly outnumber the Confederates here. And so the Confederates will start to retreat, but they did their job. They did greatly slow down this um, approaching Union Army, giving Lee time to get his men back together again. At uh, this point, I think uh, Henry's starting to just about have it with all this fighting. He writes home after this fighting at um, Crampton's Gap. He says, how long is this incessant fighting to continue? Ever since we left Washington, the can has been booming. It seems like a severe fight every day. I was never before exposed to such a galling fire. Many a bullet whistled seemingly very close to my head, but I did not feel any like dodging, but felt perfectly cool and self-possessed. Still, you know it's a hard place to stand in. But trust me in the Lord to protect me. I go forward wherever I am ordered. So it sounds like he's tied at the end of his rope, but he says, I'll go wherever he's ordered. And where he's ordered to is Antietam, the single bloodiest day of the Civil War. So right at the point where he's uh, uh, so uh, down with, uh, from all this fighting, he's going to be uh, facing one of the roughest days ever. Now, the fight at uh, Antietam starts very early in the morning. And because um, of this uh, fight at Crampton's Gap, six corps is going to be arriving to the battlefield somewhat late. And so um, we see them up here coming into the battle after there's already a lot of fighting taking place down around the Thunker Church and in the uh, West Woods area. When the Sixth Corps arrives, they do make a difference right away. They will be heading down towards the uh, Sunken Road, uh, Bloody Lane area that became very famous in the battle. They will be pushing the Confederates back. And then McClellan orders the Sixth Corps to fall back. McClellan was convinced that this could not be all there is to the Confederate Army. Based on his intelligence reports, he thought it should be twice that size. And so he pulls back the Sixth Corps to set up a hillside up here and just watch the rest of the battle. But because of the impact that they had initially, if you visit Antietam today, there is this monument for the Vermont Brigade, Henry and the Fourth Regiment, that had charged ahead of this position, but then, as I said, they pulled back on Clellan. So they'll be watching all of this carnage that follows, that um, just um, terrible casualties at, at Antietam, that in this uh, one day battle, there were more American casualties than in all of the battles of the American Revolution combined, plus all of the battles of the War of 1812 combined, plus all of the battles of the Mexican War combined, all in one day. And Antietam. Later, there will even be far more at Gettysburg, but Gettysburg at least is spread out over three days. And so, having uh, sat up on the hillside and watching a lot of this, when it's all over, Henry writes, after the battle was the worst of sights. Every house was filled to the brim as thick as they could lie. And this is a photo of um, one of the um, hospital site areas. Still, there was lack of room. All the barns were filled the same way. Still there was no room. Nearly 100 had to lie out of doors. Many remained on the field three days. Many did not have their wounds dressed for two days. Their wounds, in some instances, became maggoty. The dead had to be piled in heaps and burned, as it was impossible to bury them all. When we showed this letter to a um, park ranger in Antietam, he said that he had heard stories that supposedly there were so many dead bodies that rather than try to bury them, they had started just to burn the dead bodies. He said he never before had seen a first-hand account 
saying that that's what they've done. And here was Henry's letter saying, we just stacked bodies up and started to burn them. We couldn't bury them all. And so after this um, fighting is over, the um, end result of Antietam is that it's considered a Union victory because Lee was stopped. He could not invade the North and has to retreat. But McClellan let him retreat, let him get away. And so Lincoln now has had it with General McClellan. He decides someone else needs to lead his army. And the person he picks will be General Burnside. General Burnside, um, well, this general, the English language gets a new word, but this is where um, you know, the word sideburns will eventually come from. But um, General Burnside will come up with a new plan. And the new plan is going to be to try to move the army, the Union Army, very quickly down to Fredericksburg. From Fredericksburg, his plan is to have pontoons brought down the river, build quickly pontoon bridges, march the army across into Richmond, move up to the heights above the town, and wait for the Confederate army, and then defeat them from that strong position. So that was the plan. It was a plan that um, might have been successful. He did move the army. He took Lee by surprise by moving the army very quickly down across the river from Richmond, or sorry, from Mount um, Fredericksburg. But unfortunately, the pontoons were not there. The um, order had uh, not gotten through with the urgency that was required. And so they sat, the army sat and they waited. Mm -hmm. And they waited. And while they were waiting, General Lee's army will arrive and they will position themselves on the heights above town. So probably the prudent thing for Burnside to have done would have been to have said, well, the plan didn't work, we're going to try something different. But there were political issues. This was December of 1862. The Emancipation Proclamation goes into effect January 1st. Lincoln wanted a big victory now before the Emancipation Proclamation goes into effect. And so he's going to be putting pressure on Burnside to go ahead with his attack. And so Burnside does launch this attack. It's going to be very difficult, even just uh, trying to get across the river and being fired at the whole time, and then approaching through the town and then up the heights behind the town. Now, as it turns out, and if you ever visit Fredericksburg, you probably spend a lot of time here um, where all the soldiers went through the town and up towards the stone wall on the heights above where they're going to be uh, just wiped out by these Confederate defenders. But um, there is another part to this battle, because this is all National Park up here, where people spend most of their time. There's another part of this battle, a couple miles down the river, more pontoon bridges were put in. In fact, Henry is part of the detail to put in these pontoon bridges. And then the Sixth Corps was to attack and try to break through Stonewall Jackson's defenses and get up behind the Stonewall in this direction. So Henry will be part of that group. Henry, we know from his letters, was positioned right along Deep Run Creek, uh, right in this area. Now, the, um, this part of the, bat of the battle uh, is not National Park. This area has all become developed down in here. And in fact, where Henry was positioned around this spot, today there's a um, Wawa convenience store. But uh, the creek is still there. So we're able to um, take copies of Henry's letters and walk past the gas pumps and past the convenience store and up behind, up to where the high ground where Henry was positioned along the creek, where he was looking across, watching all this fighting take place. We've got um, this is a, a blow up that shows uh, a little more involved. Uh, so this is the Deep Run Creek right here. Henry's positioned right in this spot. And for a large part of this battle, he's on this high ground watching all this fighting that's occurring down here. And what we have down there is a lot of um, blue arrows, Union regiments, trying to break through the Confederate defenses and failing. But there's also one big red arrow right here, which is North Carolina regiments, Confederates trying to move along the creek, thinking they could break through these Vermont soldiers and get to the artillery, which is back here behind them. So Henry will suddenly find himself in the midst of this battle, facing this attack, coming uh, directly at him. And he will be 
talking about that. He says, uh, uh, as, as, this, as he's up on this high ground, the force is coming towards him, he says, I ordered a retreat of a few rods, halted, commenced firing. Still they came and gave another volley, wounding six men. I ordered another retreat, halted the brow of the hill, all the time giving them a deadly fire. Just then I saw the third regiment coming to my assistance. Now, um, Henry had a friend who was back behind watching this, and his friend apparently decided to take out a uh, piece of paper and a pencil and started to sketch what he was watching. And as it turns out, this sketch ended up in with our letters. And so what we have there is uh, Henry's in the 4th from Watt, so it's right here, 4th Regiment. So Henry's here. He had up on his high ground. He'd been forced back, but then regrouped and was firing. These are the North Carolina soldiers that have uh, taken over Henry's old position. And then right here it says 3rd Vermont. So in his letter he says the 3rd Vermont now comes to their assistance. And he said also our batteries open. Remember the cannon are back behind them. So the cannon are firing over their heads into the North Carolina troops. This staggered them. They turned and ran with us after them. We retook our old position and they lost, I should judge, over 100 men. The ground was strewed with dead all the way back to their old position after which they ceased firing. And so the Vermont soldiers have done their part. They uh, had stopped this attack. But overall, Fredericksburg is a uh, terrible defeat for the Union Army. But in the other part of the battlefield, trying to move up the hill towards the stone wall, Union regiments were just decimated in that area. And so the Union Army is going to um, have to retreat. So after this battle, Henry writes home, he said, thus ended the fight. What we've accomplished, I do not see. I hope something. Our whole loss is reported 18,000. Sunday there was a flag of truce and the wounded brought off. The Confederates are very friendly when a flag of truce is up. The lines immediately join each other and exchange coffee for tobacco. I crossed the line Sunday and saw some of their dead and wounded where our regiment fought. The enemy are also very eager to have the war closed. Monday we were relieved and went back to the rear. That night, the whole army was ordered across the river and have remained there ever since. I've been in battles before, but not in one equal to this last one. How I ever escaped, I cannot imagine. Exposed to solid shot grape and canister and rifle balls by the volley, it seems as though I must have been shielded by some unseen power. I was the object of sharpshooters, being so I could not get much cover, so I could do nothing but stand up and see them fire at me. I had the privilege of seeing all that was going on, and to see a rebel regiment advance on us, also to see a battle in the open field. I've seen enough, and hope never to see the like again. If I ever felt grateful, it was when darkness covered the field. And so the army retreats back across the river. This is a very, very low point for the Union Army. They are um, they've had huge casualties. They've um, been badly defeated. And so things are, um, are uh, they're like very depressed in the letters he's writing home. But then comes a source of hope with new leadership. Uh, General Joseph Hooker will replace Burnside and come up with a new plan. And so the new plan that uh, General Hooker has is to uh, move his army to uh, make another attack very close to where they were just at at Fredericksburg. But now they'll be attacking at Chancellorsville. And Hooker is given an enormous army. Um, he has about um, 120,000 men. Lee has about 65,000. So almost a two to one advantage for Hooker. He decides he's gonna use this advantage, comes up with a plan where what he's gonna do is have the cavalry sweep around Lee's army, then have his army attack Part of the army will attack at Fredericksburg up towards the stone wall of the Battle of Fredericksburg, but most of the army will go with Hooker back behind Lee to Chancellorsville. And Hooker's plan is then to start moving his um, regiments all around and just completely baffle Lee with all the movement of all these men coming towards him from all different directions. So that's the plan, but it won't quite work out that way. That instead, what's going to happen is. Uh, Hooker does move a large part of his army back here 
the Chancellorsville. And then we have a part left in Fredericksburg. Turns out Henry is part here. Henry is uh, the sixth core is going to be the part that's going to attack up to, through the town up to the stone wall again. But what Lee is going to do is kind of uh, defy the um, conventional wisdom of the time because conventional wisdom would say if you're greatly outnumbered, you keep your army intact. You don't divide a small army. But Lee is going to divide his army. He will leave Jubal Early's division here at the stone wall and take the rest to take on General Hooker. So Henry will be up charging up this hill. We have a, a photograph here, which is uh, six Corps soldiers about to charge up the hill. Now they don't know if, if it's uh, defended as strongly as it was in the last battle. In that case, this is just gonna be a suicide mission trying to charge up that hill. But they're about to um, make that charge. As it turns out, it's not defended as heavily this time. So they will take the stone wall. This is after the battle. Confederates have left, and the stone wall has fallen. But in the rest of the battle, things will not go so well for the Union Army that Lee has already divided his army once. Now he divides his army a second time. He'll send Stonewall Jackson back behind the um, Union forces, attack Hooker from two directions then. Hooker, instead of using his army to move all around and to try to um, confuse Lee. Instead, Hooker will pull his army back into a sort of a horseshoe defensive position. And Lee, at that point, divides his army yet again, sends part of his army back towards the Sixth Corps. So Henry, the Sixth Corps, after taking them the stone wall, is moving this direction. They will now encounter all these uh, Confederates at uh, around Salem Church, fighting a battle there and they will be defeated and pushed back across the river. When Hooker learns that General Sedgwick's Sixth Corps has retreated across the river, Hooker then retreats back across the river as well. And so Chancellorsville, another defeat for the Union Army. Lincoln will try again. He will um, be turning leadership of the Army over to uh, General Meade. Meanwhile, the, uh, on the Confederate side, Lee is not real happy with the way things are going either, because Lee's concern is the North has such an advantage in manpower and industrial might that eventually they're going to find the right leader, and he won't be able to stop them. So Lee decides now is the time to invade into the North and try to get this war over with. Lee will be moving up through Maryland, once again, on up into central Pennsylvania. And as it turns out, the, um, as the troops are moving, that uh, the um, uh, Vermont Brigade is part of the rear guard that's um, protecting the Union Army as it moves up, in the, up through Maryland. And so the, uh, in one of his letters, uh, Henry will write back, he says, uh, well actually, this letter I forgot to mention, it's kind of, kind of interesting, that um, when they take the stone wall at, Ch at Chancellorsville, Henry thought that was a really big deal. He said, since I last wrote to you, there were great changes in our position. Sunday, we carried the heights of Fredericksburg. We received showers of bullets and cannon shot, and we determined to carry them, but we did. The whole hill was one flame of smoke and fire. We advanced, they made a desperate stand that could not stop us. So you know, he thought that was a really big deal, but it turns out it really didn't matter much. And now they're moving up on into Maryland. And Henry writes this uh, kind of a interesting letter as they're moving. He says, uh, we're now moving our way through Maryland in all possible haste. We are expecting one of the roughest campaigns we ever had. Now this is uh, in June, it's very hot, humid. He says, it is reported that 40 men have died on the road on account of the heat. Many are sunstruck. We never saw such hard marching before. We were covering the rear of the Potomac Army and have got the trains all safely within our lines. If this thing is properly managed, we will annihilate these armies. But we are dreadfully worn down. Pray for us. Thousands are to be sacrificed within the next few weeks. And you couldn't uh, get much more prophetic than that. This is about three weeks before the Battle of Gettysburg. Henry says, thousands are about to be sacrificed in the next few weeks. But if we handle this right, we are going to destroy these armies. And that's pretty much just what we're about to happen. So they, um, the battle then will take place at Gettysburg. And 
When the battle begins, the uh, Henry VI Corps is about 35 miles away. So they won't be there at first. That first day of fighting with the, um, the troops that had been there at first, the Union troops will be forced back and through the town and will start to set up this uh, famous fish hook defensive position. So Henry's not there for the first day of fighting. They're also not there for much of the second day. They won't get there until about 4 o'clock in the afternoon on the second day. So a lot of this famous fighting at um, the Peach Orchard and the Devil's Den and the Wheat Field, uh, Chamberlain's Charge from Little Round Top, all of that's taken place by the time Henry gets there. So Cedric is the Sixth Corps, so this is Henry's Corps coming in very late then in the uh, second day. He does have, uh, Henry though, does have a, um, a cousin who's involved in all this, especially down in the, um, in the wheat field area where there was a um, very, very difficult fighting. Henry's cousin, uh, George Smith, is down there. Uh, George Smith was, uh, we have several of his letters, very uh, kind of a funny, uh, very good natured kind of guy, uh, very lively, always talking about like the young girls he's met along the way and things. But in this uh, battle, uh, George is um, hit in the chest. Now in the Civil War, very often if you were hit in the chest, you didn't stand a whole lot of chance of survival. In this particular case though, the um, combination of distance and wind velocity and humidity, everything played a part, caused him to be hit with enough force, he knocked to the ground, he looked, the bullet had not penetrated, it had bounced off of him. And he was able to get back up and continue on in the battle. And ended up a uh, very interesting life after the Civil War. That he'd gone out west under General Sheridan, fought in the Indian Wars, and then came back east when the business in Philadelphia. And by the end of the century, he was one of the wealthiest people in Philadelphia society. But um, anyway, right back to um, Henry and the fighting. For the, um, once the uh, Sixth Corps finally arrives, they're going to be placed in reserve right behind the little round top. And so Henry will be sitting here for the third day. And if you're familiar with the Battle of Gettysburg, uh, General Longstreet was not happy with Lee's um, plan. Longstreet felt that the Confederates should fall back, find another place to fight, or if they're going to fight here, try to outflank this fish hook. But Lee's feeling was they've tried both ends and failed, so the weak spot must be the middle. And so Pickett's charge will go right into the center. As a result, Henry is not really actively involved at all in the Battle of Gettysburg. He's sitting down here during the final day. But because they're not actively involved, after the battle, as the Confederate Army retreats, the Vermont Brigade will be sent to trail Lee's army as it moves back towards the south. A few days after the Battle of Gettysburg, Henry's involved in a small encounter in Funkstown, Maryland. Only um, 279 casualties in Funkstown. So it pales in significance to the 51,000 plus at Gettysburg. But Henry's among the 279 of the casualties. He is hit in the shoulder with uh, shell fragments. So Henry's going to be out of the war for a couple months. He'll be going back home to Williamstown to recover. And one significant thing happens in his life is while he's back home, he will become engaged. He's engaged to a young girl named Laura Ainsworth back in Williamstown. But it's going to be a secret. So we had another mystery to solve. Why is he making this a secret engagement? And we think we've got it figured out. Uh, Henry had, in with the letters, there was a small notebook. Henry had kept track in this notebook of all the letters he received and all the letters he sent during the war. He had never corresponded with Laura Ainsworth up until this time. Now they're the same age in this very small town. They obviously know each other. So apparently they just weren't very close until this trip home. We know they went on a picnic, a group of their friends. He proposed, and she accepted. And so we're thinking what must have been going on was probably they felt that either her parents or his parents would not be happy with this whirlwind romance. He's come home just like that, they're engaged. But they're excited, they went to someone to tell their friends, but then they swear them to secrecy, they said, we're not gonna tell anyone for one year about this engagement. And then Henry will be returning to the war. Although actually not to the war itself at first, but rather to New York City. Because in New York City, when Abraham Lincoln's called for another draft, 
There are riots in New York City, very violent riots. There will be um, hundreds of people killed, thousands injured in these draft riots. And so the entire Sixth Corps is going to be sent into New York City to uh, be uh, camped in the parks and to be patrolling the streets, providing order until um, the, this whole situation can be, um, can be resolved. So Henry has lots of letters back and forth involving like the, his conversations with the local people in New York City about why the army's there and what they're doing and, uh, and uh, all that's taking place there. The other thing that happens about this time is Henry's brother, Francis, will now finally enter the war. Now Francis is a bit different than Henry. Uh, he's the older brother, but he'd stay out of this. He has a lot of problems, it's Francis. Uh, he um, had physical problems, like a lot of stomach disorders, but also seems to have had emotional kinds of problems, um, suffering from depression, or what they would have called melancholy back in those days. Now, Henry was someone who tended to feel that every young guy should be doing his part during the war effort, but not his brother. None of his brother said, this is not for you. You should try to stay out of this. But there is a lot of pressure on young guys to um, enter the war. Plus, uh, there are financial incentives that uh, those who join could receive bounties from the um, state and the local government. And, uh, so for whatever reason, Francis decides now's the time he's going to, uh, to join into the war. He's also someone who writes very, very well that Francis is going to work secretly as a um, war correspondent for local newspaper back home, Juan Chronicle. And later on, when we found his uh, pseudonym, we were able to go back to um, in Montpelier to uh, go back over old newspapers on microfilm and find all of his dispatches. That he had, uh, had sent 12 battlefield dispatches to, um, back to the newspaper, so we were able to include those in the letters once we um, eventually found them. But at any rate, um, as far as Francis in the war, uh, it's going to be kind of interesting. Now, Francis is also someone who doesn't have much in the way of friends, it seems. In one of his early letters, he's a, he's a different regiment than Henry. He says he doesn't like going over to Henry's camp because there are so many Williamstown guys there in that camp. He doesn't like seeing people from his hometown very much. And so he's got a lot of problems. But funny things that happen to Francis, that this war, which is going to destroy so many young men physically, emotionally, in different ways, Francis is going to thrive in this new environment. Being the life of the soldier is going to be perfect for him. He's going to become healthier than he's been before. He'll attribute it to the outdoor living, making him feel healthy. He um, likes the food. One of his letters he writes home that he likes to camp food better than home cooking, which must have made his mother feel great when he got that. Got that, got that. Uh, the um, the uh, thing things went very well. In one letter Henry writes home, he says they did a long march and that uh, Francis handled it better than Henry did. Henry's been doing this for years. In another letter, Henry writes home to his parents. He says, he was over to Francis' camp, and he says, and Francis was happy. And he underlined the word happy. Like, can you believe it? Francis is happy. So then he's finally found something. And he says, Francis has friends, and he's respected. And so he's finally found something that has worked out very well for him. Early battles he's in, he does well. But things are about to go very badly because Lincoln will be making another change in leadership. General Grant is brought in from the West to take over the Army of the Potomac. Grant was someone who uh, Lincoln said that uh, Grant understood the terrible mathematics of this war. Terrible mathematics being the North had a lot more manpower. And if you keep having big battles with enormous losses, the South is not going to be able to keep up. And Grant is going to be someone who's going to be willing to just keep sending more and more people into these huge battles and not retreating. And so Grant will start off with a major campaign. It's called the Overland Campaign. That will start off with a big battle during the Battle of the Wilderness. In the Battle of the Wilderness, the Vermont Brigade is going to find itself in a very difficult position. That in that battle, it's going to be the uh, Fifth Corps doing a lot of the fighting at first. The, uh, Henry and Francis are in the Sixth Corps, coming in here. They will, um, Grant will learn that A.P. Hill's Confederate Corps is approaching the uh, Orange Plank Road, heading up towards the uh, Brock Road. And so the uh, Vermont Brigade is going to be separated from the rest of the regiment, or from the rest of the, the uh, Sixth Corps, and ordered to go to this intersection. 
to um, await this Confederate Corps. Hancock's Corps is supposed to join them, but Hancock's uh, Second Corps does not receive the orders in time. So the Vermont Brigade arrives alone to face this Confederate Corps. Vermont Brigade had about 2,800 men. <coughs> A.P. Hill's Confederate Corps had 14,000. And the battle then will begin. In the battle, the um, Vermont Brigade will refuse to pull back. Um, in this battle, one old brigade, out of about 2,800 men, 1,234 casualties. But they will hold that position until finally Hancock's Second Corps arrive and they um, are able to maintain that position. Both Henry and Francis will be two of those uh, 1,234 casualties. Henry, much more severely wounded, and as it turns out, then Henry will die three days later with uh, Francis by his side on the uh, battlefield hospital where it is. So Francis is able to write home to his parents about the um, death of his brother. Francis will then recover and will um, he'll be spending some time in Fredericksburg in the hospital and then be rejoining the army as um, Grant's army keeps moving down towards Richmond with Lee blocking his way all the way down. The day of the Battle of Cold Harbor is when Francis finally rejoins the army. So he'll be part of this group. They'll be heading down now towards Petersburg, south of Richmond, fighting there. But then the uh, Sixth Corps is going to be sent up under General Sheridan to help fight in the Shenandoah Valley. A major battle will take place there at Cedar Creek. In that battle, the um, Union forces are taken by surprise, an early morning attack by Jubal Early. Francis sees one of his friends hit, goes over to try to help him. While he's standing there, Francis is hit just above the ankle. He'll be taken to one of the battlefield hospital sites, which was, um, would probably look something like this, with the surgeons on the <coughs> tables outside. Uh, it's not the kind of place you wanted to be in this war, but this is an um, example of a surgeon's kit during the Civil War. And a surgeon's kit would consist largely of saws and blades because um, the real danger is infection. You know, they don't have antibiotics or penicillin or anything like that to stop infection, but if you amputate, then the infection cannot spread. And so that became very common for the Civil War soldiers who've been hit, if, if the bone has been hit. Francis was told that um, they didn't know whether if they got to amputate or not. They would give him a lot of chloroform from the mouth and then uh, he'll find out when he wakes up. And so he will wake up in one of these uh, outside recovery areas, similar to this one, and find out that they had amputated the um, uh, lower portion of his leg. He's then sent to a um, better hospital facility, one that would be like this one up, up towards Washington. And there they found the amputation had been done so poorly that they had to do a second amputation. And so much further up, and so this is a Francis photograph after the second amputation that has occurred. And so when it was all over, got the uh, question of um, was this uh, all worth it for Francis, everything he's endured? And it's kind of interesting, his last um, newspaper correspondence, he writes back, he says, this is writing from the hospital, he says, the 19th of October, now of historic note was an episode in my life ending my career as a soldier and necessitating me to act the remainder of my days in a sphere entirely different from what I would have chosen. And then he goes through the whole story of what I just told you, being shot and the two amputations. He gets to the very end of this and he says, as this is the last of my series of letters as an army correspondent, I will say in conclusion that while I regret the casualty which has befallen me, Still, it's only the fortune of the soldier, and I do not regret that I responded to my country's call, nor feel I've served with no purpose in a just cause. Though I've never done all I could wish as a soldier, still I've endeavored to do my duty, not shrinking from danger or hardship when called upon, and I am satisfied. If others wish to engage in the same service, I would say to them, the chances are their lot may end up similar to my own, but the cause is worthy of the sacrifice and I would bid them go forward. And so for Francis, it was all worth it, despite everything he endured in this war. 
And for uh, those of us who've been involved in this project for the last 12, 13 years, it's been a very worthwhile thing for us too. All the time we put into it, starting off early on, went to Montpelier, went through all the old records on computer of um, military records and birth and death certificates and marriage certificates, trying to put the whole story together, putting together family tree, connecting to the soldiers and um, celebrating up in Vermont, we got that all together. And then finally, putting together the book based on all of the letters. And uh, I remember way back when we were first started this project, I uh, told my younger daughter a little bit about the letters we found, and how someday we might put them all together into a book. And uh, she thought about it for a moment and said, uh, well, do you think you could add in some vampires? That would really make a good story. But, um, yeah, you know, I, I don't think we needed the vampire. It didn't seem to be a really good story uh, as it was. And so, uh, anyway, that, that is the basic story. So, are there any questions? Uh, yeah, I have a couple of questions. <laughs> Number one is, you know, you talk about the Vietnam War, and wasn't there any censorship in the Civil War? Mm -hmm. yeah, we were amazed by the lack of censorship. And, and, who, because, owned, yeah. and who were all these letters written to? Yeah, they were written to his parents, yeah. most of them. They were written to their Vermont, parents in Vermont. In Vermont, but yeah, no censorship whatsoever, because lots of times they would tell where they were moving to, you know, what, what the troops were doing, and um, it's nothing like, like World War II, you know, where they Yeah, I don't think it was censored. Yeah, it was nothing like that. Yes. I just have a question. Did you find out how you were related or how they were related? Yeah, um, yeah it, it took us a long time to put together, because I couldn't, you know, we kept trying in a way that didn't find any way connection. Turns out my um, grandfather, had been married twice. His first wife and I both were young. It was by going back through the family of my grandfather's first wife that we finally connected to the soldiers. So we're thinking that the letters uh, went with her when she married my grandfather. They stayed with my grandfather after he got married my grandmother. And uh, then back uh, in the 1980s, when uh, my grandmother had passed away, my father went to uh, New England and emptied out their house. We're thinking he found this little box of letters while we were up in their attic, said, I'm going to take it back home and look at it. I think he um, brought them back here to Pittsburgh, put them in his attic, and said, I'm going to look at these someday. And I don't think he ever put them away that way. Two other questions. The other thing is, he mentioned in one of the letters back home that he said we've suffered 18,000 casualties. How would he know that? How, well, how did they even know? Yeah, he was an officer, so he was one of the people who was keeping track for um, his regiment. How many we lost, and he would have been talking to other people who were doing the same thing. Yeah, they, they, they were keeping careful records. And the other thing was the um, the riot in New York. What was that about? Yeah, the um, the New York rioting was um, you had in New York a lot we of love rebels, so we want to hear. Yeah, <laughs> you had a lot of um, people who had immigrated. You know, the uh, potato famine in Ireland in the 1840s, and lots of German immigrants coming over in the um, after the failed revolution in the late 1840s. So you have a lot of people who come over here not to fight in a war, they come over here for other reasons, now suddenly they're being told, okay, now you have to be part of this draft. Uh, wealthy people could avoid the draft. They could pay money to avoid it. So you have lots of poor people who felt like this isn't fair, that you know, we didn't, we're not here to fight in a war in this, uh, in this new country we come to. And um, there was also a racial element. They blamed the um, blacks for causing the war in some way. I was just going to say, so, he, so he wrote there, about the cause. The yeah. last guy who said, he wrote about who would fight yeah. again because of the cause. Did you, were you able to determine what they thought was the cause? Yeah, they, they, yeah they, they felt the cause was the enslavement. They, they okay. felt they were on Good. that so side. Good, the soldiers and themselves and felt that. Because today, you can talk to people that still don't believe that was the reason. Yeah. Well, I mean, there, there were certain mixed reasons. People fought for different reasons. Mm -hmm. And early on in the war, they were not saying. It was only after the Emancipation Proclamation was issued, that, that changed their attitude and said, okay, this is a, a war to um, slavery. But, um, but yeah, so the, uh, the draft rise of it was just a um, very violent event, and it took the entire Sixth Corps in there with their artillery and everything to pull in the streets to um, wow. for that event. A, a couple of comments back to the beginning of your talk. There were 400,000 casualties due to sickness and disease, 200,000 men got killed. Yeah. Confirming what he was talking about yeah, and, in your, yeah. your talk. And the other comment would be, I think your audience would be interested in knowing what happened to Francis after he got back home. I yeah. found it interesting. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't usually uh, 
tell that part of the story because a lot of people told me it's sort of like a surprise ending of the story. It kind of like uh, takes your breath away when you get to, the, to that part. Um, so I thought you would tell it in the final uh, chapter on Francis. But um, how about if I tell you instead about uh, Henry's, uh, the girl that Henry's engaged in Laura Ainsworth? Because that was an interesting story. Because, um, that Laura um, was, um, uh, did eventually get married. A couple years later, she married a, um, a distant cousin, so the name remained Laura Ainsworth. They um, went out west. He worked, uh, he was uh, in engineering, worked in railroad companies, and became very, very wealthy. In fact, out in the Nebraska, the town of Ainsworth, Nebraska, is named for him. But, um, after he died, Laura Ainsworth came back to this little town of Williamstown and became sort of like a um, lesser version of Andrew Carnegie, just giving money away. And so if you go to Williamstown today, the local library is the Laura Ainsworth Library, uh, which she founded. And nearby Norwich University is Ainsworth Hall, with the money that she put in there. Outside of town is Ainsworth State Forest, with land that she gave away. And uh, she gave money to schools and fire companies and all sorts of so things. That and so yeah, ended up having a very, um, very interesting life. What happened to Frederick? <laughs> Francis? Francis? Yeah, yeah Francis. Francis, uh, like I said, I, I leave that because we want to read the book. Let's see what happens. Because it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's Harry got killed, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Henry, Henry got killed. Got Francis, uh, yeah. is the one who lost part of his leg. So, um, so yeah, it's uh, a surprise ending of the book to find out what finally happens to Francis. And so, um, the uh, book is available uh, on um, Amazon, 1995, uh, for the book, or if you act now. I do have some books with me. <laughs> was there Ethel Gordon the family? Ethel Gordon? Yeah. Um, they, uh, they would have been uh, British. Their family had come over to um, settled first in um, Massachusetts and then migrated up. Oh. In fact, Henry's grandfather was related to um, one of the women who was uh, executed as a uh, witch in the same witch trials as uh, the uh, Susanna Martin. So anyway, um, I do have a copy of the book available if anyone is interested. And um, uh, it is, um, said, uh, 1995, although the books I have, I've already paid uh, the um, shipping, handling, tax, and all that kind of stuff. And so it's just 1995. And um, to avoid change or anything, for an additional five cents, <laughs> uh, we, can, uh, we can have a uh, copy uh, signed by the author. <laughs> so thank you all very much. Thank you.